Welcome to Curious Tech, and we're starting the Rust With Me series. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'd like to learn the language Rust, uh, Rustling. Um, it's been a, a language that I've had my eye on for quite some time. So I'm going to take some time to learn it, and I decided to do this almost like live stream vlog style where I'm just going to go through the main Rust book. <laughs> Chapter 2, hopefully I spelled that right, G-U-E-S-S-I-N-G in the bar game, and then we can Open. Yes, again. Again, created our stuff. We saw in chapter one, it automatically makes a hello world. We can compile hello world. So I should be able to do okay, this isn't as um, viewable. All right, I think that's better. Should be a little more viewable. This might still be small. Like Yes, I could copy it, but I feel like just the muscle memory of typing this kind of stuff out for a bit while you're getting used to a new language is nice because you're thinking about it a little bit more as you're typing it versus just copying it. One question I have is the IDE doesn't seem to, when I'm typing things like from the standard library, um, doesn't seem to be auto completing for me. Like the IntelliSense, they usually call it. Looks like that's IntelliSense. I've done a little bit of reading on my on Go. I've done a little bit of reading on Rust, and I think this means this allows you to mutate the variable. Otherwise, the variable is immutable. I have to double check that. So if this this variable is allowed to change. I think that has to do with some of the safety as well. Interesting. I have to look into what's going on with this because it doesn't seem like it's picking up any like IntelliSense type stuff. Looks like I'm just typing in a glorified Vim section, like Notepad++ or something. It just memorizes words you've already typed before, which helps, but it's not the same. Two things, guess a number, and put your guess. 
it's just a number and it's going to make guess a string which makes sense you're going to read it and I guess you're going to change guess I have to figure out what this is going to do and we're going to print what we typed Substandard library so we're pulling IO operations out of the standard library so this is like a namespace and we called it yeah we called straight out of IO so standard IO I'm assuming you have to do some something else maybe an alias or something like that if it also ends in IO something else does or call it fully qualified not sure like standard colon colon IO colon colon standard in I don't know we'll see how this works print line is a macro to let statement and rust variables are immutable by default so I was right so one of them is changeable one of them is not changeable associated function is a function that is implemented on a type in this case new is a function implemented with type string so types have functions or associated functions that'll be interesting we'll probably come back to that so it's created a mutable variable that is bound to a new empty instance of a string so we created a string container and we stuff stuff in it. Yeah, so this part here is interesting. The ampersand indicates that this argument is a reference, which gives you a way to let multiple parts of your code access one piece of data without needing to copy that data into memory multiple times. References are a complex feature. For now, all you need to know is like variable references are immutable by default. Hence, you need to write ampersand mute guess rather than ampersand guess to make it mutable. Chapter four, we'll come back to references. So now we could fail. Sex will cover enums. What is it trying to say about result? I don't see anything here talking about results. I mentioned earlier, read line puts whatever the user enters in the string and we pass it, but it also returns a value. In this case, an IO result. The result types are enumerations off the return to enums. You have a fixed set of possibilities known as variations. Enums, yes, and we'll cover the enums later. Results variants are okay. The okay variant indicates the operation was successful. The error variant means the operation failed, and the error contains information about why it failed. So if it gets a failure, result has an expect method, because this read line returned a result, and result has a method attached to it, expect, which will cause the program to crash and display the message if you pass an argument to expect. If the read line method returns an error, it would likely be the result of an error coming from the underlying operating system if this instance of IO result is an OK value, expect will take the return OK. If you don't call, expect the program will compile, but you'll get a warning. This line prints the string. Now it contains the user's input. The curly brackets is a brace holder. The first time you set, curly braces hold the value listed after the format of the string format of multiple things so if you had a comma and a list it would just replace them in order all right so we've entered the main program here uh, for the first part of the guessing game so um, looks like it can we've got this mutable variable we can save it we, we gave it a type so it's gonna be a new string so we have a string container um, when we read the line we're gonna save it into this mutatable object which is this string 
variable we created and it just repeat, repeats back what we did. So let's do cargo run. Bam, so it just tells us what we guessed. All right, so this code contains a lot of information, so let's go over it. So we're using a standard library, which is this right here. And Rust has multiple things in the standard library. So, you know, we're specifically using the IO components. All right, let's sit here. Um, we found out that these were macros. I, I still don't, haven't looked at the code that supports these macros and you know why you would use this macro over just the basic print line um, I guess we'll figure that out as we get to further chapters but at the end of the day these are our print line macros um, then we're storing this variable which we talked about um, so let is the thing that creates a variable um, looks like variables are immutable um, by default um, this also kind of reminds me of Go, where it looks like you can create a variable and you don't have to declare its type, so it does like a little bit of duct typing. So depending on what value you have on the right hand side of the equal sign, it will make it um, determine what the type is. Um, we'll get more clarification on that, but just by quickly glancing at this example, that's what it looks like it's happening here. Um, but we have this big thing of declaring everything as either mutable or immutable. So, you know, whether or not you can or can't change it. Um, looks like chapter three, we're gonna be talking about variables and muta mutability. Um, comments, so you could do slash slash, we could find out, do bulk comments work as well. Yes, so we can do sort of the standard bulk comment type deal. Just gonna undo these. Cool. Returning the guessing game program, you know that let guess, we variable guess, we want to bind something, We're calling a new string. That is a growable UTF-8 encoded, which is nice nowadays. Anytime we have anything with strings, it should be preferably UTF-8 already. In any modern language, the colon colon syntax indicates new is an associated function to the string types so types can have functions okay so anytime you have a type i'm assuming we'll be able to make our own types later and add our own associated functions to those types and then this thing says hey we've created a mutable variable named guess and it is a string and it's going to be a container given by this new function associated with the string then we're gonna use the IO, read the line. So we talked through all of this already, so we're just gonna keep scanning. We could have a failure, so we, we talked about this. So we broke it out on multiple lines just to add the readability, so we don't have the super long line. So we nested it and just continued to add the dots. Um, mm -hmm. um, read line returns a result and then they use ex expect off of that result chapter six looks like no that's covering more enums okay result variants are okay or error and result has an expect method so this is already built into the result that will always return from read line I wonder if I like hit this in the IDE. Nothing. Go to Yeah, what is like Yeah, unfortunately it doesn't seem to like like that. It's not what I was hoping it would do would just automatically go to this implementation of readline and let us look at the standard library and just pull it up in a tab. Um, again, it's something I do common in other languages is even if it pivots into the standard library, it's a good opportunity to sort of read not only that function, but what's around it, what else is in the file. Just gives you a lot of background context. As we, as we saw earlier, there's the whole documentation file, so I'm sure if I look around, I can find it, but it would have been nice to just be able to quickly pivot to it.
If you don't include expect, it'll compile, but you'll get a warning. One warning. And it says, hey, like, this result may be an error variant which should be handled. Okay. if that sounds coming up in the video because I, <laughs> I put that back there to be like a thing that looks cool and it's noisy and bright turn the light off but now it's randomly making noises in the video randomly making noises all right so now we want to generate a secret number and we're going to use it with the rand crate so we're going to go to the toml file we're going to go in dependencies Rand equals zero dot eight dot three. Do, 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 do. Um, follow semantic versioning. I believe this links to the Sember. Yep, to so the common Sember document. Um, so by default, I guess Cargo will update the most minor version number here, but it won't necessarily update this one. And that's what it's talking about here. Like it, this actually go represents this syntax, which allows the minor number to change. So we should see it pull down ran plus its dependencies if I rebuild it, which is interesting because I'm not using it. So it'll still pull down its dependencies either way. Let's see, what is it building it into? Various questions like what, what does it mean to, to clear an unused dependency? Do those things get wrapped up in the binary? Like, do they just get put into certain directories? Still learning, but we'll have to figure out. So it's definitely fetching something. So it's pulling this stuff down. I, I suspect that it's gonna download and compile them all. Maybe it just makes them available within this crates directory because this whole thing we're working on was done with crates. Let's see. Including external dependency, cargo fetches it from the registry, copies the data for crates.io. After updating the registry, cargo checks the dependency section. Uh, after updating the registry, cargo checks the dependency section, downloads any crates that aren't already downloaded, and we added that. If you So if you run build, build won't do anything extra. So even if you make a small change, it won't do anything. So cargo lock helps with reproducible builds. could make it go, if you do cargo updated, it'll only take the minor builds. All right, so now let's, wants us to implement some more stuff here. So,
So, I don't know, we have a secret number now. The threaded range, thread range? I don't know what this is doing. Gen range, looks like it's going to generate it in the range. But I don't know if it's exclusive of these numbers or inclusive. Alright, so the, we added the ran range. Oh, did I? Oh, I didn't add that. That's not going to work. Random number generator. Semicolon. Alright, that's better. Now we're adding two lines in the middle. Ran thread ran RNG, which gives this particular random number generator that we're going to use. Local to the current thread of execution and seeded by the operating system. Interesting. Thread RNG. This method is defined by the RNG tree we brought into scope, and we'll use the RNG statement. The gen range takes the expression and, and the argument and generates a random number. The kind of expression we're looking at is start to end and is inclusive on the lower end, but exclusive on the upper bound. So this will do one to a hundred range, which is equivalent of one to equals a hundred. Yes. Note, you won't just know what traits to use and which methods and functions to call from a crate. So each crate has documentation for using it. Another neat feature of Cargo is running cargo doc dash dash open, which will build documentation provided by all of your dependencies locally and open it in your browser. Okay, yeah, that's that's cool. What is it? Another example that like if you if you pull down all the dependencies you think you need while you're working on an application, you'll have all the standard library documentation, you'll have example code documented, you'll have um, all of the library documentation, like, this is lends itself really well for like, some offline development, because almost everything you might want to know will be sitting here um, on your own box. So like, once you've pulled stuff down and compiled it, um, you won't need. Did I have a typo here? I did. Could fix that. Um, you won't necessarily need the internet unless you just had like some very specific question. Um, Rand. Look at this. Look at this. All coming from your local machine. I like, I like that. That's, that's pretty cool. Examples. Does everything have a book? It'll be interesting to see how many, like the further you get away from like, or library crates, like crates created other by other people, how well the community keeps these documents up to date with good examples and information you want to know about how this works. You know, the this is this is pretty cool. So they even have pseudo random number generators versus what they consider cryptographically secure, um, what their performance is. Right, like XOR shift kind of reminds me of old linear feedback shift registers. It's basically an XOR shift. A um, bit more memory, it's lower performance, but um, all of this is here. Fascinating. All right, let's um, let's get back to our document. Did I miss something about printing the secret number? Because I didn't see that. Oh, the secret number is. 
goes right before this. I may have made this comment earlier, but right now, the like I'm using the Rust plugin in C Lion, and I wasn't able to like jump to implementation, and I also am not seeing like what feels like true IntelliSense. Um, so just comments as I'm using this IDE. Um, maybe I haven't installed everything correctly. Maybe I haven't done something right, um, but. Did I do that in the right order? Yeah, it didn't ask me yet. It's so weird, it's showing, like, it showed me the secret number before we guessed. Um, but we're just getting the program together, so we're just dropping lines for now, I guess. Now we have a user snippet and a random number. We can compare them to the step is shown, listing to before the, the code won't compile quite yet. But install this. So what are we doing? Compare ordering. So after we guess, wants us to try to match this. Match looks like some kind of keyword. I don't know what the deal is with that. I'll have to see. If you're looking at this and wondering, I'm using the Vim plugin, so I'm using Vim commands. Something small about languages I like is when you have um, sets like this, not forcing the last line to not have the semicolon, have allowing uh, the comma, a comma to end on every line. Um, just a small little thing you don't have to think about, like I copied this line three times and just tweaked it. If I need to come in here and delete a line, reorder a line, whatever it doesn't matter i don't have to think about like oh well this last line doesn't have not supposed to have a comma um, i like it when languages do that it's something really tiny small but i like it so we brought ordering into scope less greater equal we're going to need to do anything to turn this into a integer because this is creating a number I believe right like it's taking a number but we guess we're guessing like with a string so 
we're, we're making some comparison here. Is this doing type coercion? Let's see. Here it's comparing guess a secret number, then it returns the variant of ordering. The match expression, do do do, is recalled on comp, CMP, and the values of guess and secret number. A match expression is made up of arms, and arm consists of pattern to match against, and the code that should be run if given to match. Fits the first arms pattern. Rust takes the value given to match and looks through each arms pattern in turn. Patterns and the match construct are powerful Rust features that let you express a variety of situations your code may encounter and make sure that you handle them all. These features will be covered in detail in chapter 18. I didn't fully follow this arms thing. I, I don't fully understand what it means. Um, so I don't know if it's like a pattern to match against. And it looks through each arms pattern in return. So I guess these are the arms and they all have their own pattern based on this comparison. I don't know. These features will be covered in chapter six and 18 respectively. So I'm guessing match in arms is what they mean. So, okay. I don't have to stress too much. I don't fully understand it, but I will. Well, hopefully will. Using Caesar as 50, 50 is greater than zero, blah, 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 blah. So let's try it. Ha. Huh. It thinks it's gonna compile, no, it's gonna fail compilation. And according to this, it's gonna fail because we didn't do anything with the types that I was wondering about. Um, let's see. Line two. Oh man, I'm failing with these. Double colons. Always add like, I don't like, stop asking me. I know when I want to add things to get. All right. Cannot infer for type integer, and then I get a bunch of other unhappy things. Core of the error the states is mismatched types. Russ had strong to static type position. However, it has type inference when you wrote this. Russ will be inferred that guess should be a string. It didn't make us write that type, which is what we talked about. So it duct typed a little bit. It duct typed a little bit. On the other hand, is a number type. A few of Rust number types can have a value between 0 and 100. I32, U32, unsigned. I64, I32. Unless you add type information elsewhere that would cause Rust to infer a different numerical type, the reason for this error is Rust cannot compare a string to a number. Ultimately, we want to convert the string, and then the program reads the input, blah, 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 blah. Oh, so. Interesting. So we're just going to reabsorb guess as a U32. Interesting. We create a variable named guess, but wait, doesn't the program already have a variable named guess? It does. It will allow us to shadow it with a new one. Reuse the variable name rather than forcing us to create two unique variables such as guess string. We'll cover this more in chapter three. It's used often to convert from one type to another. Huh. All right. Mm -mm -mm.
All right, so we figured out that we're shadowing um, this guess variable. So we're gonna go ahead and um, capture this message here. Line is trim, parse, expect. This variable is going to be contained in a string. Read line. Is an input in their guess which adds a new line character to the string. For example, the user types five, they press enter, then we get five new line. New line re represents character turn or and a new line. On Windows, it represents also a character turn and a new line. Trim splits all of that off, removes it. Um, then we parse it. because this meth method on strings parse. Parses the string slice into another type. So we have the guess type over here. So this is where we're gonna do our type conversion. So with parse, we we're t essentially telling it, hey, turn it into this U32. Okay. We'll only work on characters that can logically be converted into numbers and can easily cause errors. For example, if the string considered, you know, an emoji thumbs up, percent, A, there's no way to convert that into a number and the result might fail and the result would be, and that's, oh yeah, so now we're catching that right now. So we're expecting a number, and right now you could put in something that's not a number. So let's see, let's see, let's run this. All right. Undeclared type ordering. What did I break when I moved stuff around? I think that means there should be something at the top of this file that handles ordering. <laughs> what did I miss? Oh, yes. Or der ing semicolon. Aha. Now, let's try this again. Some other errors, semicolon, line 21, print line, should have a semicolon. Did you notice I don't have like linting or anything turned on in this IDE? So I'm catching it at compiles. Um, please enter a number for your guess. I'm not gonna enter a number because I think we should get an error this time. Please. Right, so to panicked at please type a number. I'm, I'm sure we're gonna do better error handling later because it just simply panicked. Um, but it did throw the please type a number. Too big. But it doesn't remember anything, so I don't know what happens if we actually give the right number since we're telling it to us. We win. Alright, so Things working. All right. Mm. We did this parse. We know parse won't work. Now we ran it. All right. So even though spaces were added before and around the guess, you know we got rid of those. Did I, did I try that? 
space, 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 five, space, 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 space. Yes, five. So then like if I do the same number, space, 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 two, space, 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 space. Okay. Trim's doing what you'd expect it to do. Alright. Allowing multiple guesses within loopings. Looks like we're at the bottom section of this document here, so we're almost done with this chapter. Loop keyword creates an infinite loop. Sounds good. We'll add a loop to give you some more of a chance at guessing. And they're doing it right after this. Please input your guess. And then they are closing the loop, close bracket on this loop after this. So they are dropping a loop here. Actually here. Let's see, line 28, 12, so that's like 26 lines. All right, let's see, almost better. All right, so now we have a loop. As you can see, we moved everything from guest input onward in the loop, so be sure to indent the lines. We just did that. User can get out with Control C. Even if I win, though, I don't think I'm going to pop out. Right? Yeah, it's going to ask me for another guess. Sixty-six. Too small. Too small. What was it? Sixty-six. So seventy. Too big. You win, didn't exit, right? Got a control C out. Or they typed quit, whatever. Um, you win. So this time they're using a bracket. Highlighting against this block, why? All right, what do we got? We have number. These two should match. This is super weird. These inner two should match. Okay, and it looks like they are adding a bracket here.
really quick, which one is this highlight with? Doing the same thing. Did I lose something here? compiled this time. Something's off though. This should be a Rust format or something like that, right? I don't know how this works actually. It fixed it. So I just ran Rust format. I wasn't sure like why stuff was looking that way, but I ran Rust format on it and it fixed it. So what do I mean? Uh, I'll just break this again. So there. The file looks weird. Run Rust format. Since I'm in the IDE, it takes a little lag second, but it caught up, it put it back. Um, so that's one of the things that's nice with languages with good tooling like this is at least you can get like some of your language structuring um, in a good way by just leveraging the tooling. So if I had this fully set up, I would have Rust format just every time I save the file, automatically run continuously. Um, that's the best way I found is on save. Um, and then since I'm using Vim mode, I can sort of easily, you know, colon W and anytime I do that, I know I'm saving it and I want it to go ahead and run Rust format. Um, probably worth it like right now. What's, what's, what's it going to take me to set that up? Edit, references, there, last time I did this in Goland, they moved where they want this to happen. I don't know, file. Something like a watcher. Actions on save. Reformat code. Yeah, but it's not. I'll look at that later. There was something supposed to be like a file watcher and you can tell it to watch this file and you can say run this utility. You can point it right at this binary. Um, you can probably give it a fully qualified path to where this is and just on save it will run this and then you can set like include excludes on the file etc but now we break boom so handling value input behavior rather than crashing the program when a user inputs a non-character let's make the game ignore that so they can keep guessing all right so parse Yes, dot trim parse.
and we, we learned about OK and error. Um, we learned that those were always returned. So whenever So if I'm reading this correctly, um, basically, if you actually got a number, then continue on. If you didn't, like, continue through this program, if you didn't get a number, exit this loop and start the loop again. This one is interesting. The previous ones were a little bit clearer. Um, this is angry because it doesn't have a semicolon. I had a comma. Um, I just happened to notice it, but when I was looking through the errors, it wasn't that obvious. What's it angry about this time? Let guess u32 equal. Did I get rid of match somehow? All right, now we're into it. All right, it's 80, so let's do 50. Too small, let's do xxx. Hey, try again. Let's do 80 out of here. Cool. We can switch from expect call to match. Oh, yeah. Was I not paying attention to that? What were we doing before? Oh, dot expect. There was nothing there. I see. To match, and match does what? Result, result returns an enum as OK and error. So we take a look at those. We're using match expression here as we did with the ordering result on here. If parse is able to successfully turn a string into a number, we'll return OK. And that will continue on. That OK value will match the first arms pattern. So I guess these are the arms. and pattern and the match expression will return the num value that parse produced and put it inside the OK value. The number will end up right where we want it in the new guess. If parse is not able to, then we'll get an error. And if it does not match, the underscore is a catch-all value. In this example, we're saying we just want to match all errors, no matter what the information they have inside them. So this program will continue into the second arms code, which is continue, which is basically what I thought it was going to do. Sounds about right. Then we ran it, which we already have. Awesome. One fine, tiny tweak. We will finish the guessing game. Recall that the program is still printing the secret number. That worked well for testing, but it ruins the game. So let's delete the print line and output, and here's our final code. So this time, I don't know. This might take a while. I actually have to guess. And put your number. Let's start in the middle. 50. Too big. So let's go 25. <laughs> and I got it on my second guess. And if you probably were figuring how I was going to guess, I was basically searching halfway between wherever the end is and wherever I was and just sort of using a kind of like a binary search. But found it super quick. So move on. Awesome. So, oh, we're at the summary. At this point, you've successfully built the game. Congratulations. This project was hands-on. Way to introduce many new concepts, let, match, functions, external crates, um, these arms concept that they keep mentioning. 
Um, so chapter three covers most of the concepts of the programming language, variable data types, functions, shows how to use them in Rust. And chapter four explores ownership that makes Rust different from other languages, and that's what I've heard. So I'm curious about the ownership model, like how you own memory management, who's responsible for it, like what all that looks like to get this really strong, safe language that still does its own memory management. Um, and then five, we'll do some advanced things like structs and method syntax. So that's interesting, right? I mean, that's where we get into, I don't, I don't know, I haven't read enough about Rust to know if Rust considers itself like an object or any language or, or more composable like Go or some hybrid of, the, of it. But either way, chapter five is how you take on some of those constructs. Whether, no matter what you call it, like we're looking for things like information hiding, encapsulation, um, composition, how do you do those types of things with the language. Um, six seems random how enums work seems pretty straightforward kind of surprised it's not really in maybe chapter three but maybe they think there's enough here to cover um as they mentioned we we leveraged an enum here uh this okay error is apparently in enumeration so this is a great little hands-on exercise so we will pick up again on chapter three